Hello. Yeah, the mic stands are kind of like holding the cable in place, so I'm afraid to like touch anything at this point. All right, uh, we're going to get started. Welcome to uh, the second annual Metasploit Town Hall. Thanks to DerbyCon for letting us do this. It's uh, our DerbyCon exclusive event. Uh, so the first question that might be on your mind are, who the fuck are these people that I'm looking at up here? Uh, so we're going to just go ahead and start by introducing ourselves. I'm uh, David Maloney, the light cosign. Uh, I am a senior security researcher at Rapid7 on the Metasploit team, and I have been working on Metasploit for about seven years now, uh, five of it getting paid by Rapid7, so that's a pretty good gig. Lance? I am uh, Lance Sanchez. I've uh, been working with Rapid7 for four years, and I'm the lead software engineer on the Metasploit team. Hey, that's me. Um, I am now the community manager. I also still do some development from time to time, uh, but I spend most of my day on Twitter these days. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really good at Twitter. I think. Yeah. Um, I've been working on Metasploit for about nine years. I started uh, submitting patches in 2007. Got commit access in 2008. Uh, started with Rapid7 in 2009. Yeah, look at that. You and your hey. what a handsome man. No, I work in marketing now. So uh, I used to be an engineer. Then I took a rope chain to the knee or something. Um, yeah, I've been at Rapid7 for six and a half years, commit on Metasploit for seven years. Um, we're actually, I think we're at like a gradation of like number of commits, like on average, almost exactly. <laughs> no? Like I have very few and Brent has quite a few. So that was the joke. All right. Anyway, uh, going on. Howdy. Hi, I'm, I'm Brent. Uh, no one really calls me Buster B, but that's why I am online. Um, and so I've only been with Metasploit and Rapid7 for two years, uh, but I'm actually the manager of the team. So, um, so yeah. Hi, everybody. It's very good to meet you and uh, work with you. I see a lot of awesome, familiar faces out there and uh, going to give some winks out. So, hey, let's get going, man. Okay, so we talked about who we are, but uh, the faces of Metasploit itself are actually very numerous. Uh, the last time I looked, GitHub said we had about 363 actual contributors to the project, which is quite a few. Uh, so I went through and took a look at who the top 100 of our uh, contributors were, at least the ones who actually had pictures on their GitHub accounts. So here's all the faces of the top 100 people who actually had a GitHub avatar, which we got a nice big wall of people here. But if we, uh, if we go ahead and we take out all the people who are, who are or have been Rapid7 employees, we still have a lot of faces there. Metasploit has been and always will be driven by the community, by you guys sitting in the audience and anyone watching this uh, on the live stream or watching the video afterwards. Uh, and so we can't do this without you guys. And that's basically the whole point of this event tonight, or today. It's not tonight, but uh, is just for us to sit down and basically talk with you guys, our, our community, our users, our contributors, and the, the reason that we do this. Um, so uh, this is where we're going to open it up to you guys here. But I want to just put down some ground rules first. No trolling. Seriously, um, there, are, there are going to be people who have serious questions and feedback, and as, as much as I enjoy a good troll, like, please don't waste their time. Uh, and also, we're not here to troubleshoot, so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there, we have a lot of resources available if you're having, like, a specific problem with you can't get some module to work or something like that, so there's a lot of avenues for that, um, and yeah. But do... Ask us any questions that are on your mind. Make suggestions. Tell us what you love. Tell us what you hate. Tell us what we suck at. I promise we won't get offended. Uh, and maybe just as importantly, tell us when somebody does something better than us and why you think they were better than us because it's the only way we'll learn. Uh, and uh, tell us what problems you guys have that we're not solving for you right now. So with that, uh, open it up to the floor. Who wants to... 
say something, ask something? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question was about uh, fuzzer modules and and whether they're going to be uh, can going to be enhanced and and uh, um, continued. Um, we don't have any current plans for that. Um, they, I I think the reason they are primarily useful is because they're they're very targeted. Um, so as opposed to something some general fuzzer like Peach or something, um, they're very targeted. They already know how the protocol works. So the fact that we have other protocols that don't have any fuzzers associated with them means that there's definitely room for, for growth there, for improvement. Um, but like I said, we don't have any direct plans for that. Um, that would be a great place to get started contributing. And I hate to be the guy who says patch is accepted, but I say that all the time because patch is accepted. Um, adding, adding something like that I think would be... Um, valuable to a lot of people. So if if you're looking for a place to get started, there's a great suggestion. Also, if there's like something specific you want to see a fuzzer for, you can always, you know, hit us up on IRC, the community site, or or even open a GitHub issue and say like this is a thing that I need. Um, and we'll we'll take it under advisement. Ouch. <laughs> what, what are you running framework on? On Kali? So we actually don't control um, packaging on Kali. Um, so they decide when um, packages get pushed. Um, and we've, we've worked with them before. Um, and we'll continue to work with them. We're trying to make it as stable as possible on that platform. Uh, because I know we have a whole lot of users there. Um, so... I'm sorry it's broke, but... Well, what version of Kali also? Are you on the latest Kali rolling? Okay, because I thought that most of those issues had actually been resolved on Kali rolling. We, we did have some issues uh, about a year or two ago with uh, the way we were doing Kali packaging. and Basically, we were trying to be too heavily involved, I think, in the process instead of just letting the Kali guys do their thing, and we we, uh, we sat down with them and t and talked about it, and uh, basically let them just control that process. And I think it's been a lot better since they just took over. So definitely agree. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> that would be bad. I would like to conduct a very unscientific poll of just a show of hands. Who runs Metasploit as the Kali packaged binary uh, from from their sources? I, I I know you do, dude. Okay. <laughs> All right. So like, uh, who does like a framework checkout like straight from GitHub? About equal and anything. Uh, who's never used Metasploit before? And you're in the wrong room. Okay. <laughs> All right. So about uh, like 40, 40, 20 ish, I guess, of of this completely representative of the industry audience. Right. <laughs> Actually, I'm I'm curious. So does anyone use the uh, the packages that Rapid Seven puts out? The the open source packages. Crickets. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Nobody knows about them. Why don't yeah, you talk maybe, about them, Brent? Maybe no one knows that Metis that actually Rapid7 builds Debian, RPM, um, OSX, and Windows packages of the open source, and they're updated every single day. Does anyone know that? No. No. Oh, well, very interesting. That's good. That's really good feedback here. Uh, <laughs> they, they've been out for uh, almost a year now. Um, so. Um, we kind of at least a good beta run, um, so it sounds like maybe we need to promote that a lot more. Hey, yeah. Would you encourage people running Kali to use the Debian packages? To use the uh, the Rapid Seven patches? Um, you know, Kali does a pretty good job. They have their own fork of Metasploit. If you go to their Git repos, you can find it. It gets updated whenever we tag it every Friday at noon. So they do a pretty good job. 
I would say, based on my observations from colleague users that reported bugs, we've had a couple of things that have come up. One of them is sometimes we'll make a change. Like, for instance, we made a change to how the version um, file was formatted. Kali ran a sed script on it as part of their packaging, and it changed MSF4 to MSF5 accidentally. Um, so everyone's config files went to MSF5. Um, it took us about a couple weeks to figure out what the hell went wrong, but we were able to fix that. Now, sometimes we break modules, and that's just kind of a, there's, there's over 3,000 modules in Metasploit. There's something that's going to be someone's you know, pride and joy, but doesn't get looked at by everybody. So um, sometimes that happens. We try to fix them as soon as possible. If you run the, the Rapid7 pack, edge. Um, so there's a pro um, and a con. <laughs> you get bug fixes right away, but you also you, you, you get the excitement of all that stuff. So uh, so yeah, I'd recommend it if you're running something like Ubuntu, if you're running like Red Hat. If you're running Kali, I'd still kind of recommend you use Kali's packages just because it integrates well with, say, their Armitage install and integrates well with other tools because they have a specific location that they expect everything to be in. But we did work together. We made the database management tools the same between the two packages so you don't have to learn a new way to do your database, um, some other things like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and they even work with MSF I'll go right up on Windows post. and on OS X. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Say OS X packages work, so yeah, it's an, it's an actual like .dot pkg file. It'll install Metasploit. It even has a GUI, um, so it's really sexy looking. Uh, we even followed like the uh, the uh, the marketing team's style guide for the right colors and everything. So uh, sweet, it is, it is bona fide. So anyway, check it out. It's even open source, so you can improve the installer if you want. Can I be completely honest uh, yeah, real quick? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so the no. question was about basically our QE process and testing and automated testing. So I'll let Lance answer some of this. So we do a lot of testing on the pro product. Uh, there's minimal testing on the framework. We mostly make sure that uh, unit tests pass, things like that go through. We have next to no exploit tests. Uh, they're hard to set up. It's something that I've been trying to get more time to work on. But it is painful to go through and verify that this exploit works every time. So it is on the roadmap, something we'd like to get done. I don't know when that's going to happen. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we've actually, one of the things that we've, a lot of our test environments surrounded around is like Metasploitable 2, Windows XP, that kind of stuff. What we found is that that's not really relevant to anyone's real environment. You know, you guys probably figured that out five years ago. And it's like, they, yeah, I don't run into that many. XP boxes these days, and if I do, that it's not, you know, it's important as like making sure Windows 2012, 2008, uh, Windows 10, all those kind of things continue to work with all the modules. So actually, uh, we've been working on Metasploitable 3, which is going to be Windows and Linux based, and um, that's sort of going to be our test bed for future um, kind of unit tests and all that kind of stuff. And so it's got a lot of interesting new stuff in it. We also uh, we also have a lab environment uh, in our office that has a whole wide variety of various platforms of every version of Windows back to 2000 SP4, uh, a bunch of different Linux targets and things like that. And we we try and do as much manual testing as we can, especially for things like the SMB login module that you mentioned. Uh, we try and test it in as many different scenarios as we possibly can. Unfortunately, sometimes we we miss things. Um, an example would be that we recently overhauled how we do SSH and we just, we didn't think about a couple scenarios that could happen where like, if you did SSH over a proxy pivot, like would this one piece still work? And so, you know, sometimes you get a little bit of egg on your face because you miss those scenarios. Uh, and also sometimes we just don't have the software anymore. Like if you get some old exploit that requires a specific piece of software, sometimes it's really hard to find it again. Does that answer your question or?
This sounds like a question for the community manager. Yeah, so some of that is, uh, so the question was, how do we uh, communicate the, uh, the the big architectural changes that are happening, like with the, the login scanners? Um, a lot of that will show up on blog posts. Um, I do a weekly wrap-up. Um, I, I call it weekly, but it's actually about bi-weekly, because uh, I'm a slacker. Um, so watch the blog posts. Um, occasionally, I post things on Twitter, too. Um, the issues queue is going to be a flood of information, but all of that stuff shows up there. Um, so if you're if you're willing to wade through that, then everything will show up in the pull request queue at, at the very least. Um, we're we're starting to um, to to look at ways of of getting our our development process more out in the open. Um, we use uh, we use our, our ticketing system internally. Um, because that's what the company uses, um, but it doesn't translate well to GitHub issues. So we're trying to trying to come up with a good way to um, make that a little more open, a little more transparent. Um, and we've looked at we looked at Waffle IO. Um, did we look at anything else for that? I wrote some scripts. <laughs> <laughs> wrote some scripts. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, we're trying. Uh, if you have a good suggestion on where that should be communicated or how best to do it, please let me know. Tomorrow, <laughs> Egypt here is giving a talk called The New Shiny in Metasploit. <laughs> so you might want to go to that one too because uh, uh, it will talk about the new shiny in Metasploit. And so just come to DerbyCon every year for the rest of your life and you'll at least get one year fidelity. And uh, to, to reiterate a point that we'll probably hit a lot of times, uh, testing, if that's an area that you have any interest or knowledge of, uh, is another great place to get started contributing. Uh, like, it might not seem as glamorous as writing, like, the next heart bleed or shell shock or whatever. Uh, yes, yes, you, we, we all know about your opinions on heart bleed. Uh, but my point is that... Uh, it may not seem like as glamorous, but it's actually really, really important that we continue to find good ways of adding test coverage. And every every uh, commit pushed back to master on framework triggers a continuous integration build of all the unit tests. But uh, as Lance was saying, like functional testing is still something we're trying to get our head wrapped around how to do it in a reliable way, especially for things like SMB-based exploits. Like something goes the least bit wrong and that target ends up in a weird state and then like you can't do anything with it till you reboot the machine and uh so if that's an area you're interested in I'm, i'd just also say that you know that's another place we'd ha happily take contributions from outside of rapid 7 for as well anyone else yes sir <laughs> um, there's uh, there's a good talk by uh, by one of our our our, our Metasploit contributors coming up soon. Um, you should definitely check it out. JDuck's talk, um, which is going to be uh, about some Android exploitation. We have a lot of awesome stuff planned for Android. Um, we also have been working on some some native interpreters that can be injected into potentially iOS, um, into um, Linux, into BSD systems into all sorts of a variety of systems. We've been doing some internal testing. We've been, we also have a, a public project that's been out for maybe two months or so. Um, so I think we've got a lot of momentum around IoT. I've got a backpack stuff full of IoT devices that I'm going to be hopefully uh, demoing later um, on Sunday when we talk about some, some new payload stuff. So I think that's going to be a very important um, area for Metasploit moving forward is basically doing a router embedded, um, that kind of exploitation and uh, sort of showing the weaknesses that we have within the ecosystem, um, within everything from printers to, you know, your baby monitors, that sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's going to be a big place that Metasploit's going to be going in the future. Um, I think post-exploitation is probably going to become more and more important as we move forward and uh, basically improving the data model so people keep track of all the crazy stuff that they find on, um, on the network. I think those are probably going to be more of where we focus and not quite as much on 
remote, no access bones and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I think exploitation is still very important, but it's somewhere there, there are lots of really easy ways to get into things as well. So I, th I think that's kind of where we're going to see Mesoit going um, as we move forward. Well, I, th I think the stuff that um, Brent has been spearheading, was it Brent and OJ and Tim Wright? Tim Wright. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, have been doing a lot of work in Android in particular um, over the last, what, year and a half, really. Right. Um, that's all Project Metal. Yeah, and, right. and so search for, like, Metasploit Metal, and you will uh, you can read all about that. Um, the can interesting thing... The metal? Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, metal, like this stuff. Uh, anyway, um, the interesting thing about Android is like, you know, Android today uh, and iOS today, they're they're hard to exploit, you know, unless your name is JDoc. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, is that a lot of the IoT stuff that you see um, that's running Android under the covers is super, super, super old Android that will never, ever get updated. So it's all Android 4.0.4 stuff, right? Or, or 4.4 saw, is about the limit of what you're going to see. I saw a treadmill that was running Android 4.2. Perfect. A so, treadmill. <laughs> like so a thing they'll have unpatched on. bugs forever. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, it's, it's a target rich environment out there for, for Android powered devices that may not necessarily be handsets, but absolutely talk on, on your target's network. I mean, I think the, the big thing with the traditional mobile landscape and, JDuck's probably going to be like looking at me like you're an idiot here in a second, but I, I would say that it seems like the attack surface on on a lot of the mobile like tablet and phones just doesn't seem to be anywhere near as big as like a traditional computer. I'm looking at JDuck to make sure he's not just like you're you're completely out of your mind. Okay, JDuck disagrees, so uh, I'm going to stop talking about it then because <laughs> go see JDuck's talk. I'd also say integration is going to be a big part of Metasploit moving forward, integrating with other tools um, more closely. Um, the thing is, Metasploit started out, you know, 10 years ago as a, kind of an omnibus of like everything you could think of, everything from fuzzers to post-exploitation to exploitation to auxiliary modules to a zillion things under the sun. What we find is that these days that there are a lot of very targeted projects out there that do one thing and do one thing really well. And um, we basically are kind of thinking, why don't we identify the things that we kind of ah, don't do so well and, and you know integrate with the thing that does it better? Um, so when we're talking about, for instance, I'll, I'll make one one suggestion: PowerShell. Is, is there are some amazing frameworks out there? You know, I, I would say like PowerShell Empire is an, an incredible tool. Um, a lot of us use it internally as well, and so we're looking at how can we better integrate with PowerShell Empire. So if people do PowerShell exploitation, why reinvent the wheel inside of Metasploit? You know, integrate better. And so when we're thinking about adding new features, we think well. Is there a f someone who's done it really well already? And how can we leverage that and make it so that people kind of have a one-stop shop and, then, and they can integrate with the tools they like and still use Metasploit for the places where it fits in and does things really well? Anyone else? JDuck. Yes? Sometimes module deprecations happen when we've added a module in one place, and then we moved it to another place. So we end up with two modules that basically do the exact same thing. So we usually try not to break people's workflow by moving a module and deleting the old one so that they got RC scripts or whatever hard-coded to that. Sometimes there we'll see module consolidation, where one module does three things really well, and then there's a whole bunch of like little modules that do one thing kind of half well, and that's where some of those other deprecations come from. Um, I think they're usually for the best. Um, and, and again, it kind of reduces the, the number of like sort of like halfway modules that are there in the ecosystem. Yeah. So so one of the recent examples was uh, the old LSA secrets uh, module that we when we started looking at it, it turned out like under at least certain circumstances, it just plain didn't work. 
Uh, and now we have Mimikatz integration, so it just it made no sense for us to have this this module that we had written and to keep it here just because it, you know it was built here when we had integration with a tool that was custom built for this purpose, kind of to what Brent was saying a minute ago, and was better at it. And yeah, it was it was better at it. So like rather than being like, well, we made this thing, so it's great. We're like, all right, this thing it's a little broken, it's old. Let's just use Mimikatz. Let's just do the things that make sense. I, I don't think, like, we like to talk about how we continue to grow and we like to use six, like, module numbers to talk about that, but I don't think there's, like, a hard focus on increase, like, just driving that number up. It's about what makes sense and what's relevant. Uh, and we've always had sort of this weird, uh, dichotomy of we have stuff in Metasploit that is, like, old NT4 based exploits and things that we're like, we have no way of testing this really or like knowing for sure if we ever break it, like how do we even know? And so there's this weird line that we're trying to figure out how to walk of not taking away things that people might still find useful because NT4 systems are definitely out there, um, but not have to try and like actively maintain stuff that is essentially impossible for us to maintain. Do you have any comment about that? No, you covered it. Yeah. Crickets, cricket, Bueller, Bueller, Brandon Perry. More spinners. Okay. Like multiple uh, lines of spinners. Patches accepted. I, Some fireworks. I, I will. I will add a command line argument for you that will just fill the screen with spinners. <laughs> well, it'll be the dash b Perry option. <laughs> Uh, so the question was about my talk on the new shiny. Is it going to be new shiny that exists or new shiny that's coming? It all exists. I'm only talking about things that are on master today. Yeah. So uh, the the follow up question was about like what some of our plans for the future are, and uh, I'm gonna jump in here real quick. Uh, I know some of the other guys can add some stuff. But one of the big things we're actually focusing on right now is sort of a major architectural overhaul. We've spent a bunch of time this year uh, upgrading Ruby and Rails and all the backend dependencies, but now we're focusing on like breaking our code up. Uh, if you've been watching, like a lot of the Rex libraries are getting broken up into individual Ruby gems and being given their own individual testing, uh, like their own unit tests so that they run independently. And we're looking in the long term to start breaking Metasploit up into more component pieces that interoperate with each other instead of this giant monolithic uh, entity that, you know, is a massive download. Every time you update it, it's huge. Everything has to load every time you start it up. Um, and so, you know, the conceptually, I always thought of Metasploit framework as a toolbox. And I feel like what we've created instead over time organically has become like a more of a Swiss army knife where it's all the tools in one, but you have to carry the whole thing with you, and each tool might not be the best tool for the job. And I want to get us, I want to see us move back towards being a toolbox with the right tools all available there. And, you know, you can download it all together, but then you only need to grab the tool that you need for that particular time. You, just, you looked like you had something you wanted to add to that. Um, yes, all of that. Um, also, we're... We're kind of in the background working on, on protocol supports for SMB2. Um, th that's been that's been in the background. It's been in the, in the works for a long time because it's a big, massive protocol. Um, and we we had to put that on a back burner for a while. Uh, I'm hoping to pick that back up soon. Um, I would love some help if any of you are interested in hacking packets. Um, SMB2 is a ridiculous protocol. Uh, less ridiculous than SMB1, though. Yes, considerably less ridiculous. SMB1 is mind-blowing. It's completely insane. SMB2 is just weird. It's, yeah, it's better, but, yeah. Um, so, yeah, working forward on, on new protocol support is a big thing. Um, 
integrations with other uh, yeah. other tools too. I think is going to be a, a major focus. We've talked about it a lot for years, but I, I think uh, this year in particular, it's going to be a, a big thing. Like PowerShell Empire was mentioned, uh, but I mean, we, we've always had our integrations with Nmap and John the Ripper, for example. But like, we're going to be working on making those probably better and looking at other tools like. Uh, uh, Brandon Perry over here wrote a plugin at one point for SQL map integration. I'd like to see that. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I'd like to see that like uh, get improved and get some love and be made more of a first class thing. Um, as, as Brent said, like the, this idea that we have to build everything ourselves just isn't feasible for the amount of time and resources that we have. And I'd really like to, I'd really like to see our community of of various people who make InfoSec and hacking tools work together more tightly and closely. And so that's one of the big things uh, I hope for over the next year. I think as far as a community, I think I've seen Metasploit t uh, take a shift as well. Um, I, I see some really amazing new contributors that have sort of taken over. It's like almost like a new generation of Metasploit hackers. And uh, I know Metasploit sort of had some shifts where you had like all these guys that were really active five years ago. And these days they're not as active. And something that makes me really excited is we're having a whole new generation of people that are just discovering Metasploit for the first time, writing their first modules. And what we're basically, I think is really cool is that we're kind of incubating a whole new set of people who are, who are uh, kind of shaping Metasploit in a different way than maybe it would have been built like four or five years ago um, or 10 years ago or something like that. So uh, as, as we move forward, I, I think uh, one of the most exciting things for me about Metasploit is just welcoming all the new community members, all the new people who have contributed uh, this year, um, it just it, it kind of blows my mind. Uh, all, all the new guys. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that at, at uh, Egypt's new shiny um, talk as well. But um, yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty much the thing that really gets me going about Metasploit. Anybody else? Uh, and so the question was about integration with. With Nexpos, uh, which is Rapid 7's vulnerability scanner. So, uh, Metasploit framework, uh, in of itself can import data from all, pretty much every Vuln scanner I know about, uh, from a, from a network Vuln scanner standpoint. Uh, we do have integrations with Nexpos, um, specifically, of course, because it's our in-house product and some of that is built into our commercial offerings to be a little more in-depth, but uh, from the open source standpoint, we want you to be able to pull in data, and the, the Rapid7 marketing people are probably going to hate me for saying this, but uh, from from any other product, whether it's another company's commercial product or ours, um, I, I don't feel like it's appropriate for our open the open source part of Metasploit to favor Nexpos over anything else, like. Whatever tools you need to get your job done, that's what we should strive to integrate with. Yeah, so we, we, we've actually um, we, we, we've actually done some work this year to uh, integrate with the actual official Nexpos client gym as well. So that's going to actually improve our import performance uh, considerably once we get that um, pushed in. Um, something else uh, is we've actually been getting um, updates from like Nessus and from OpenVAS and, and the guys who work on those projects, and they've been uh, up, upping their integration stuff as well. So it's it's pretty exciting. Um, I, I see it, uh, everything just becoming tighter in the future. Go yeah, it, it would be, um, if it weren't impossible, it would also be suicidal for Metasploit to like favor Nexpos over anything else, right? Um, we absolutely should be doing that and be, and work well with Nexpos because we like know those guys and they're like right over there, you know, conceptually. Um, but, um, it is, it's, Metasploit is, like a lot of pl places talk about how they're, they support open source and they have this open source project and you'll see a lot of open source projects out there, um, that have one, two, four contributors. Um, you know, Metasploit is unique in that we do have hundreds. Um, we have, we have at least 200 <laughs> that don't work at Rapid7 and never have. Um, and so that's, uh, if, if there would be a revolt, you know, like I know, I know JDoc ran his own fork of Metasploit for two or three years because he hated the way we loaded everything. <laughs> and then we fixed it and now I don't think he supports it anymore. So that's good. And <laughs> so, 
Um, so yeah, like if you have like a vulnerability scanner you like, or like you know web application scanner you like, or something else, something that's a little more active, like a firewall manager system or like web application firewall, something like that, that you want to work with Pen Display with. I I know that I know that first off, you know, we can't stop you from from doing that integration work, and secondly, we will help you do it because Rapid Seven is very serious about our commitment to open source. Uh, we make cool T-shirts and and hire people from the open source community and all that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, so like so so yeah. I mean, we're really we're really into that. Um, and and it's it's a really unique project to be involved in. Not just because it's so friendly and we all hold hands and sing kubaya when we are popping boxes, um, but because it's it is so active. Uh, externally, it's not just like coding with the windows open. It's we we are we we do collaborate. So yeah, so I mean, what you see a lot of times with the uh, commercial open source companies, like that have an open source offering and then their commercial offering on top of it, which is sort of the model that Metasploit has had for for the past however many years since the acquisition, seven years or seven, so. Yeah. Um, a lot of times uh, those companies will say, oh, yeah, we have this open source thing, but they don't really support it that much, and they don't really care about it. They just use it as a driver to drive people to their commercial offering. I have many times had conversations with people at the very top of our products organization at Rapid7 who I, I basically say, what do you see as the role of Metasploit framework of our open source side? And what they always, what they all inevitably say is that it drives everything we do in Metasploit. That the framework and the open source community is the most important thing, and that they are dedicated to protecting and and cherishing that part of what we do. So it, it's a very unique environment, I think, uh, at Rapid Seven in terms of how we support that. And if they didn't think that way, I wouldn't still be here. Yeah, truth. Did we answer your question? <laughs> Jeff Jarmok. Yeah, yes. <laughs> we, the, so the question was about a Metasploit module that attacks Metasploit, but I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to be a little more specific because there was more than one. <laughs> Yeah, just recently. <laughs> so, you so update that, Metasploit, please. <laughs> a little bit of both. Both. <laughs> so yeah, we uh, we are both like, oh shit, like we screwed something up, and oh cool, hey, this will be funny. We're gonna have a Metasploit module that'll attack Metasploit, uh, and we've had those. Before too, there's uh, in the one. brute forcers. There's a Metasploit RPC brute forcer that somebody wrote. I mean, Script Junkie wrote a whole bunch of directory traversals um, from a malicious interpreter server. Um, that one was awesome. Where if uh, if Metasploit connected to a, a malicious uh, interpreter session, um, it could do path traversals and drop files in your like .ms4 directory. Um, so it was code execution from msfconsole.rc, uh, and I love that stuff. I think it's hilarious. I mean, we'd be giant hypocrites if, if we didn't embrace that, I think, right? Like, part, a big part of what we do is the idea of sharing uh, the information about these vulnerabilities and, and exploits to make security better for everyone and increase awareness and allow people to test. So if we didn't do that for our own products, we we just be a bunch of hypocrites. Right. Plus, that shit's funny. <laughs> I will note that we uh, we actually went from uh, disclosure to us to uh, fixes and release within less than a week. Um, so we we don't hold on to things, um, and there's really no point to it. Yeah, man, we should have taken the sixty days. What's that? <laughs> we should have taken the sixty days. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, we worry about the users too. You know that kind of thing. Uh, so users, one person can find users. it, anyone can find it. I mean, right. I mean, not necessarily, but yeah, you get it. So as a as a handler of some recent Metasploit bugs, like I feel their pain, 
Um, you know, we do get bugs occasionally, and we report bugs um, a lot more often in other people's stuff. And so the question was, like, how is our relationship with vendors uh, when we publish exploits? Um, it's good. It's it's better than it has been ever. Um, you know, we haven't had really anything in the way of like any any sort of chilling effects on our on kind of the normal day to day on disclosure. Um, you know, despite the fact that we have a gr like we do have a company behind us, Rapid Seven, and Rapid Seven has a growing customer base, and we're running into more and more often customers that we didn't. The researcher didn't know that they were a Rapid7 customer. It could be like an external person who doesn't work at Rapid7. We have researchers inside Rapid7 who don't like have magical access to our entire customer and prospect lists. Um, and so when those things come up, we, um, we do take a pretty hard editorial style line on that where we don't hold back just because someone is a customer of Rapid7. Um, you know, we, it, it's helpful on disclosure because we know who to call because they pay us money. And so we could just like talk to their account manager and say like, Hey, um, uh, we can, we have a bug on your stuff. Sorry. Uh, we're going to publish a Metasploit module. Would you like to continue giving us money? Um, <laughs> um, so that conversation is a little bit, um, it, it's usually like our own salespeople who freak out over that kind of thing because it's their paycheck full. Um, but, uh, for vendors in general, I'd say that we have, we do enjoy a pretty decent relationship, um, by and large. Like I, you know, I handle, um, all of the outbound vulnerability disclosure stuff. Um, so, my job is to, you know, approach people and say like, hey, I'm really sorry to be the one to tell you this, but you have a bug, right? And so we try to be friendly about it. We try to be front with the kinds of timelines that we expect out of people so they at least have a notion. Um, interestingly enough, Brandon Perry, no one gave us any sort of timelines or notions on on when they were going to publish their own vul vul published vulnerabilities or anything like that when they... <laughs> You reported a bug. Yeah. <laughs> it's very helpful when you report bugs to other people um, to be very explicit on what you plan to do afterwards. And it's harder to be explicit when you're in a bar, I guess, and not writing things down. <laughs> but but um, thank you very much. That was a good good find. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so we try to make sure that like the people that we work with, we actually are working with them. We're not just shaming them. We're not just saying like, oh, your software is dumb and you should feel bad about it. Um, you know, we try to make sure that not only are we reporting vulnerabilities when we get sweet, tasty Metasploit modules out of them, but like fixes are reasonable and mitigations are reasonable and they're not. And, and, the, and the mitigations actually work. Um, and they're not just like caught on their back foot when when we release Metasploit modules. They have some kind of notion of how they're going to respond to it. And generally, it's been okay. I still occasionally get like nasty grams from on like attorney letterhead, but it's not, n nothing has, has really come up, I guess, in about, I don't know, eight or nine months um, lately. Are we out of time? We are. We are. So, uh, this went by really fast. Uh, thanks everybody for, for coming. Uh, all of us will still be yeah, here. We'll be around all weekend. What? We'll be here all weekend. Yeah, we'll be here all weekend. So, uh, if you have other things you want to ask or talk about, uh, just come find us around the con and come talk to us. But yeah, thanks for showing up, guys. And feel free to hit us up on Twitter or email or whatever.